Okay, we are recording now, and uh, Greg, you're up for the IOM, IOM uh, trace options. And I think I stopped sharing. So you go ahead. Okay. Okay, um, so do you see the slide? Yes. Let me make it larger. Okay, okay. this is good. Okay, so um, uh, IOM trace, um, uh, IOM um, support in uh, new MPLS uh, architecture with their uh, network actions is one of the use cases uh, that uh, we discuss. And um, um, so the base document is uh, progressing nicely in IPPM working group. Uh, it's uh, draft uh, ITF, IPPM, IEM data. And um, um, expect that IANA will create um, IEM option type registry uh, where um, number of trace options will be uh, registered. So in a data document, there are four of them, uh, pre-allocated trace, incremental trace, uh, proof of transit, and edge to edge. Um, pre-allocated and incremental are meant to be hub by hub. And as you can um, guess from the uh, name, that pre-allocated uh, is that encapsulating node I am encapsulating node allocates their space for I am data, uh, and the data profile is part of I am header that uh, precedes uh, this uh, data block. Uh, in incremental, expected that each uh, transit node uh, I am transit node will add. Um, its data and to the packet, again, appending uh, the IEM portion so that uh, first it will be uh, IEM header, then followed by their list of uh, IEM data records. Uh, proof of transit, uh, primarily uh, it's a uh, um, more detailed mechanism discussion in SFC uh, working group. And edge to edge, it's uh, information being recorded by their uh, encapsulating node, and only the uh, egress node adds to it. So uh, effectively, only one node provides the information. Uh, further, we have uh, two additional trace options defined. Uh, I am direct expert. Uh, it's um, mode of IEM that expects uh, the a transit node uh, to uh, process uh, the profile according to the local policy. Um, so uh, there is no uh, IEM data to be uh, put into the data packet, the, what we can call trigger packet. Uh, the hybrid two-step, uh, it's a similar mode. So no data being added to um, not no IAM data added to their uh, trigger packet, and uh, it defines the mechanism how to collect data uh, so they follow the same path topological with an option of doing it out of band. Um, so, in other words, uh, using the different class of service. Um, Comparing the direct expert and hybrid two step, uh, what we can note is that um, <clears throat> direct expert requires additional information to correlate data. So uh, when they reach a, 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 a collector uh, function uh, in the domain, uh, then um, to um, correlate and collect together data from different nodes that belong to the same. Uh, trigger packet of the same IAM flow, a monitor data flow um, requires additional information. So the hybrid two step, because it collects uh, data uh, sort of following their uh, trigger packet, um, then um, correlation association of data uh, with their trigger packet um, 
becomes uh, natural native. Um, advantages, so both methods, direct expert and hybrid, um, we can uh, see that their advent, uh, difference from the uh, other trace options is that uh, no additional data being added uh, to their um, trigger packet. So pre-allocated incremental uh, header um, provides their um, information that reflected here in the slide. Um, and IEM trace type is uh, the field that provides their um, profile of information that uh, expected to be collected. So that could be ingress, egress interface IDs, um, node ID, uh, timestamp, and such. Um, some data have a short and long format. So, and uh, then short and long format will have a distinctive flag. Uh, proof of transit is a little bit different format of the header. And so obviously edge to edge. So this is a direct export IM header. As do, you, do you prefer to take questions at the end, Greg, or um, you uh, don't? No, actually, yes, thank you, uh, Tarek. Yes, uh, please uh, interrupt me uh, or help me uh, if there are uh, any questions. I, I have a question myself on the first slide. Uh, basically, okay. one is generic. Uh, is IP implementing all the options? Uh, IP encapsulation. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think that in IPv6 uh, there was a discussion of whether all options will be uh, supported. And okay. uh, I think that would be a good discussion to have, especially because. Um, Uh, their uh, hop by hop tracing would be in extension header. And I think that edge to edge will be signaled to, uh, in extension header as well. Okay, the uh, second question was uh, the trigger packet that you were describing in the two-step approach. Is it a, a, is it a control plane packet or is it a user, a normal user traffic will carry a trigger? Yes. Yes, there, the expectation is uh, that it's a normal user traffic, so that um, similar how it will be in the direct export uh, or uh, any other IOM. So uh, we have a data packet and a IOM encapsulating node, um, so that's an edge of IOM domain, um, adds, uh, it could be a uh, some uh, edge of an, another domain as well. So it, we uh, add their um, IEM header or IEM encapsulating or shim layer, uh, depending on you know, how we want to um, use it. Obviously for pre-allocated uh, trace and if their domain is uh, relatively extensive, so that's a space that needs to be reserved uh, would be significant. And so to confirm that my understanding, even if I carry the IOEM uh, extended header, uh, if there was no trigger packet, the nodes will ignore it. Yes, that's 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 how it should it's supposed to be. So there there could be a, a several. Um, um conditions that make a packet a trigger packet uh so first uh node expected to be capable of supporting iem second the iem expected to be uh enabled and then uh because concurrently uh several flows can be monitored uh using iem then um uh, the flow profile can be uh, communicated to the transit node so that it, it reacts only to particular um, 
flow that is monitored. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tarek. Um, so the direct expert here, as uh, I mentioned, let me make it larger. Uh, it requires additional information that um, will uh, be uh, can be used for correlating IEM data exported from the node. So that that's the purpose of this optional fields. And this is. Uh, a working group document that I think that it is in a working group last call at IPPM working group. And then further, we have uh, their two step. Um, so the drive describes not on defines not only this uh, header, but the procedure of how uh, hybrid two step operates. I will note that. It can be used not only in IOM, but for example, alternate marking method as well to collect information. So, in conclusion, um, yes, Tarek. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, you 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 were showing per node, um, you know, um, head, uh, TLVs or sub TLVs. Uh, how do I know that this is for this node? In the packet, like, is there a a node ID or? Uh, no, no, that's that's what uh, when we um, discussed there uh, earlier, uh, <clears throat> a transit <clears throat> a transit node uh, expected to be enabled to support IOM. Well, first it expected to be uh, capable of supporting IOM, then it enabled, and then it can be enabled for the particular flow. So there is no information uh, in the IUM encapsulation that explicitly lists nodes that are uh, expected to add their information. So uh, it's a node local uh, configuration that enables it to um, act on IUM header. Okay, but uh, um, assuming that the policy says, uh, you know, uh, process the IOAM packet, uh, how do I distinguish one met one metadata for uh, added by one node from another uh, metadata added by another node? Uh, that, how do you distinguish? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, so. Um, firstly. Uh, they're expected that uh, a node ID will be required to okay. be added in the uh, IOM data as okay. a part of um, node record. Okay, that, that makes sense, yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> Uh, we have discussed an impact of um, instec uh, data on the performance, but if we um, consider uh, that IEM will be in a post stack data, um, some IEM trace types might have. Uh, might require using uh, uh, a lot of um, space to collect data, especially consider um, pre-allocated trace mode. So if uh, we have a number of nodes that need uh, to put uh, their information in the packet, then post tech data will take a lot of space. So that then the payload will be pushed Further down, and uh, processing that mode uh, might be um, a challenge. Um, incremental trace type also might result in a similar um, 
hurdle. So that's why I thought that it would be um, helpful to discuss which of the uh, IAM modes uh, we want to uh, really investigate and document. So in my opinion, we would not say that, oh, this mode should not be used. Um, I compare it to uh, BFD over MPLS LSP specification, uh, RFC 5884, uh, which uh, documented only asynchronous mode of BFD from uh, 5880. And uh, other modes are outside the scope. So more recently, there was an interest in uh, investigating and documenting use of um, BFD demand mode, and so we have the, this document that now uh, gets it there. So, because I know that there were some comments and questions and saying why we want to, um, why I want to uh, have this discussion, why not to say, okay, any uh, IAM mode uh, can be used uh, with their um, MPLS network actions. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, yeah, indeed. I know, Greg, that there were a couple of things that in the past we we talked about. I'm hoping that you know your presentation has cleared all the doubts. Uh, but uh, if there's still any, please feel free to ask. Uh, Thank you. This was very interesting. And uh, um, will you be sharing it on our wiki, uh, Greg? Greg? Um, actually, um, I tried to put it on the wiki. I couldn't find the right controls. But uh, if you need, uh, I, I can resend the slides. And uh, if you can help me put them there, I would much appreciate it. Sure thing. Okay. Definitely. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll Thank come. you. All right, uh, next up, I think Tony is uh, ready to go and please go ahead and thank you. We, we don't hear you, Tony, maybe you're still muted. All right, I think I have my act together. Oh, we can hear you now. Good. All right, so this talk is about looking at how many bits we need in an entropy value for M&A. Um, this was inspired by a, con by a conversation we had a while ago where we started discussing how many bits were absolutely necessary and we didn't come to any good conclusion. So I decided to take a closer look and see what really is a comfortable value. Um, this is not a discussion about hashing functions, although we have to talk about them a little bit, but we're not trying to recommend one. Um, this is not a gener discussion about how to generate entropy. Uh, that's up to the LER. Um, this is just a question of how many bits we need to carry. Uh, there's obviously no upper bound to the number of bits we could carry. There are obviously trade-offs you have to make um, depending on how many bits you want to carry. So the real question I'm just trying to answer is how many bits are the minimum that we have to carry? And if there are any questions, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, this is complicated. If, if you get lost, it's you're not going to be able to catch up. All right, to start, I want to quick review of statistics. Um, when we generate random numbers, they're going to have a distribution. And in statistics, um, we have what we call a probability distribution function. This is how we characterize uh, the odds of something being generated. And this, is, this represents a probability of numbers being generated between minus four and plus four. And this is, this is in floating point. And this is what's called a Gaussian curve 
or a normal distribution. Okay. And the typical way you would get this is if you drop uh, marbles on down a bed of nails and you'll get a curve that looks something like this. Uh, an alternate distribution is something we're going to want. Uh, it's called a uniform distribution. All of the outcomes are equally likely. And in particular, for our case, we're going to care about what's called the discrete uniform distribution. We're going to want a bunch of integers, all of which are equally likely. All right. So what are our goals with ECMP? We'd like to use all of our paths roughly evenly. And towards that end, we want a discrete uniform distribution. And we want to do that on a per packet. And in some sense, we are being very optimistic and hoping that that becomes um, a uniform distribution of bandwidth as well. Um, we very much want single flows to use the same path for ordering reasons. And we know that we have in uh, legacy stuff for an entropy label with 20 bits. And then downstream just selects paths based on the entropy entropy label. Um, 20 bits is too big to use as a uh, index into an ECMP table. That's a million values. Nobody wants to carry around that. So what we've typically done is to compute a hash value by taking an entropy label and a bunch of other values from the packet and hashing them to produce that hash value. We then index into an ECMP table, and that produces the path for us. So what we're trying to achieve here is a uniform distribution of hash values. Again, a discrete uniform distribution of those hash values into our ECMP table. Is that clear? Okay. Um yeah, it's clear. Thank you. Okay. Um, if we have a good hashing function, it can produce a uniform distribution, even if the inputs are not entirely uniform, but they do have to need randomness. Now, if the input is a constant, let's say the LER always injects an, an entropy label of seven, okay, there's nothing that the hash value, the hashing function can do. But if the LER is doing something decent and generating something that has a significant amount of entropy, then the hash function should take and distribute that entropy, and we should end up with hash buckets that are evenly distributed. And there are lots of very various hashing functions out there. You can add the bits together. You can mask off high order bits. You can XOR bits together, CRCs. MD4, MD5, SHA, it keeps on going, lots of things. So then the question is, how many bits should we use for this entropy in MNA? And I'm calling that field an entropy value for now. We need enough bits in our entropy value to yield a uniform distribution of the hash value. Now, from my perspective, there's some bounds. Um, the biggest routers that I know of today are on the order of a thousand interfaces. And channelized interfaces have become rare. Um, we seem to have a trend towards deaggregation. Uh, so we're not building bigger and bigger and bigger boxes. And so I'm not expecting us to be building much bigger boxes anytime soon. Uh, this argues that 1024-way uh, ECMP is probably sufficient. I don't know of anybody shipping this right now. I know people a couple of orders of magnitude below that, but not anybody close to that. And just for give ourselves a safety margin, uh, I was picking 4x. So if we could do 4096-way ECMP, I think that might hold us for quite a while. Okay, doing that requires a hash value with 12 bits. 
And of course, we still need to support smaller degree ECMP, two way, four way, 16 way, uh, 17 way. So we need uniform hash values that get come uh, anywhere from two to 12 bits. All right. So what we wanted to do is to take a look and see how many bits we wanted and see how many additional bits we would want to add and hash to get to a 4096 way ECMP value. And to make sure that I wasn't making things too easy, um, what I tried to do was to generate entropy values that were a Gaussian distribution, that, that funky curve that I showed you in slide two. And the point of the, doing this is to simulate an imperfect upstream. This gives us randomness, but not necessarily a uniform distribution on the inputs. And that forces the hash function to actually extract the entropy from the entropy value. And then the question becomes, is the result uniform? Tony, before you go further, uh, um, there is a question in the queue from Matthew. Please. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just questioning. Um, on, on your scaling, um, scaling figure there of a thousand. Um, I'm assuming you're only assume you're only talking about ECMP over um, essentially IP interfaces which are directly bound to, to physical ports. Um, because have you considered like I don't know if that's really relevant to entropy label, but if you're hashing across say multiple tunnels, so you're doing ECMP across um, potentially thousands of LSPs. So if yes, if you want to do ECMP across thousands of tunnels, you could have an arbitrary uh, unbounded number here. Yeah. Yeah. So um, suddenly that becomes an uninteresting question. You just need infinite. <laughs> I don't think it's infinite, but <laughs> realistically, but I don't know if a thousand or four thousand is necessary. Probably enough, but it's almost certainly enough. But um, I. I yeah, it shouldn't be constrained just by the the number of um, physical inter physical ports that you have on the uh, on routers today or in the near future, because because you could hash onto a virtual. Understood. You could do anything. Again, I'm just trying to understand where the the sweet spot is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So to look and see the uniformity of the hash values that are computed, um, what I did was to take a look and see how many of the hash buckets, uh, what the hash buckets look like after hashing. Um, I've generated enough samples so that every hash bucket should get 1,000 hits. And then an error would in indicate a difference between um, 1,000 and the actual number of hits that we got in that bucket. Uh, so I picked three error metrics. Um, these are used elsewhere in the literature. Uh, the root mean square of the error, the mean average error, and the mean average percentage error. Okay. So the simulation results are pretty straightforward. Um, first of all, all of the error metrics seem pretty well correlated. So which metric you want to look at is not so important. Um, I somewhat arbitrarily picked a, a mean average percentage error of five, i.e. 5% 5 error as a threshold of acceptable. Um, never going to get perfect. So how, how accurate do you want to be? Um, I would argue that if you're 95% correct, you're in pretty good shape. And then I started throwing very different things at it. If we start off with just two bits of entropy value, then none, no hashing function can actually get decent entropy out of that. Um, it just doesn't work. So you end up skewing things. So we actually want more bits. And what I found was that some hashing functions work better than others. 
this is a 16 way ECMP, so four bits of result and five bits of input. And some hashing functions are adequate with that. And some are not. And I don't know why some of the hashing functions don't do well, and I don't know enough math to understand. And somebody wants to look at that more, they're welcome to. And then what I saw is looking out, um, as soon as there are at least 10 bits of entropy, most of the hashes start to work for pretty well. So 10, bit, 10 bits of entropy and hashed into 10 bits, and that actually was useful. And I took a look at the C, okay, if I take a look at all across all of the uh, range of uh, hash values um, and all of the number of bits added. Um, what I found was that adding four bits, three or four bits actually is a pretty good compromise. And bit five was not a big improvement. Um, and I took the mean of all of those results to see what's going on. So the errors added per bit um, actually fall off pretty quickly. And so what this suggests is that what we need is enough to do 4096 plus three or four more bits. Well, 4096 is 12 bits. If we wanna add four, that turns out to be a convenient 16. And again, if I look across all of the algorithms and all of the ranges of inputs, um, what I end up with, um, things are very uneven. And some algorithms are better, some are worse. Uh, again, I'm not trying to recommend what, al what hashing algorithm to use. It's just sufficient to show that there is a hash algorithm that does produce nice results. There are multiple ones available. So we need at least 12 bits to get to 4096 way ECMP. And we should probably do uh, add four bits. And so we should at least have 16 bits. And we can add more bits, that's fine. Um, it's a trade-off between adding a little bit of entropy and, 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 and adding overhead, so. Um, now, one of the things I wanted to do is validate this result and show that this re result holds even if we're not doing non-power of two hashing. Right. In the real world, we may have three-way and five-way ECMP. We're not so lucky as to always need exact numbers of bits. Um, so the way to get the right range, one way is at least to use a mod operator. And so what I wanted to do is to take 16 bits of entropy value and hash down to 16 bits and then mod n. And add mask and XOR or now just identity functions if you do this. And then I wanted to evaluate that in 3 to 2047. So again, once we do this validation, we've got um, good, clear indication that everything works well. 10 bits of entropy does most of the work. 16 bits is just fine. At we once we start doing some more strange things, uh, we get 16 bits of entropy and we get a mask, and we have a mod operator that works well. The other hashes aren't so well, so choose your hash function wisely. And that's it, Tarek. <clears throat> Thank you, Tony. It's on the previous slide here. Um, so you're showing the different, um, you, you chose different uh, uh, performance indices, uh, the RMSE, the MAE, uh, I, I forgot what, where they standing for, but uh, I'm presuming there were some collisions when the hash function was invoked on the entropy value, value right? Absolutely. Uh, why, I'm curious, why didn't you show the number of collisions? Um... So the number of collisions shows up as error, right? Huh. Mm, so it's embedded in one of those, okay. Right, so 
So a hash function is going, let's, let's say we're doing 1024 way hashing, right? We're gonna end up with a hash bucket. There are 1024 buckets and each bucket should have a thousand hits in it. And a collision means that we're gonna have too many hits in one bucket and too few hits in a different bucket. Got it. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? If none else, I have another one. Please. Um, I, I, I know this is how things are working, but I just want to get your thoughts on, you know, is it, I mean, maybe it's acceptable. Let's say uh, the entropy value is being added by the ingresses, and that's what happens today is the mm -hmm. entropy value gets added by the, uh, the ingress. Um, and the ingresses don't co uh, coordinate their assignment of entropy values, right? They are independently uh, assigning entropy value to different flows. What happens if the same entropy value gets assigned to different to different flows by different ingresses? So if the, each ingress is generating random results um, that are uncoordinated, then you should be fine because again you're generating enough entropy. Um, if all of the various ingresses are generating non-random results, then you've got a problem. Um, if all of them are doing, and a typical thing to do is to hash packet values to generate the entropy, um, if they are all using a same hashing function and they are not salting the hashing function, then you have a problem because you may have multiple collisions. Right, and we don't standardize what the ingress uh, should or uh, do, right? And it would Just... be very hard to standardize that, right? An ingress cannot simply manufacture random numbers. That's not helpful, right? It has to be a characteristic of the flow. So the function that it performs on the flow to generate the entropy value has to extract random bits from the flow and be consistent. And I think everybody knows about the importance of salting it. Uh, hey, Tony, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, so my question is, uh, uh, you are assuming the, this entropy value is also uh, is randomly generated, right? And uh, Not entirely. Yeah. Excuse me? Not entirely random, right? I mean, you, you just uh, use some uh, ran random number generator to generate uh, entropy. For um, my simulation, yes. Oh, okay. So I, I wonder if you just use some uh, simpler way, like uh, uh, just uh, increment this uh, value each time by one. Will that change the result? Um, later, you will use a uh, anti uh, ECMP uh, location. You will use another hash function to hash over the, this uh, entropy value, right? So, right. yeah. If I, I just I, simulated I, with a sequence, a, a uniform sequence then I'm injecting a uniform distribution and hashing doesn't change that. I'm going to get out hopefully a very uniform sequence, which would be a false uh, result because it might give us a result saying we didn't need more bits. Imagine if I have a 16 bit entropy value, it's uniformly distributed and the hash function that doesn't do anything then I again end up with 16 bits that are uniformly di distributed. So 16, that would indicate 16 bits is always enough. I, I, I wonder, um, it might be, the, the result might be similar because uh, um, your hash function will uh, redistribute the, the, the value, maybe. Uh, um, so, so, so that's just my guess. I, I, I think the result might be similar. Yes, that would have a similar result, but it would actually be overly optimistic, right? In the real world, we can't expect that the LER is going to give us completely uniform entropy values. Any other questions um, to Tony?
Cool. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you so much. I was going to say thanks. This is very informative. Uh, I hope we can draw some conclusions from it uh, for our uh, network actions and embedding a number of uh, bits for the entropy in our design. Uh, thank you, Tony. Okay. Um, going back to the agenda, I think we are done for today. Uh, unless anybody wants to uh, say something before we conclude. Um, but then the, the items on the agenda are ready. Uh, we went over. So if uh, nothing else, let me give them a chance if anyone wants to speak. No. Okay. I want to thank everybody who joined. Um, thanks, especially thanks to Tony and Greg. And uh, we will see you next week. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Bye. Bye.